My name is Dr. William Padula. Also, Dr. Iris Syed will be presenting to you today. We're going to be discussing the consequences of tick-borne or Lyme-related disease on visual processing. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Syed. Tick-borne disease is known as the great mimicker. It can often mimic as a MTBI, so concussions, um, multiple sclerosis, depression, and other psychiatric disorders, cardiovascular disease. Often, uh, tick-borne disease uh, can cause conversions and accommodative insufficiency, ocular motor dysfunction, and other binocular vision dysfunctions. Um, this often can misdiagnose a patient um, just as a binocular vision problem. So understanding the symptoms and the presentation of a patient can help us um, in understanding the visual processing dysfunction. Lyme-related disease affects not just the eyes, but also the brain processing of vision. So we have to understand uh, tick-borne disease as a vision as a brain process facilitated by eyes. The official numbers are often uh, misrecorded. Um, the, the prevalence of tick-borne disease in the U.S. is greater than 300,000, according to CDC at this time, and there are many other cases that are uh, un not even recorded at this point. It is a serious and chronic illness for many, and it is one of the most common vector-borne illnesses in the U.S. Often the cause is due to a bacterial infection, uh, spread by uh, black-legged deer ticks, um, also known as Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, often tick-borne disease can present, uh, other than Borrelia, with other co-infections. Some of the most common ones are Bartonella, Bicia, and uh, Ehrlichia. Lyme disease is spread with deer ticks, which appear in that first picture as the black cape red, with the red-brown body and they are in several different stages of life, which is that second picture, and they can be as small as uh, that last picture. So they're often hard to find, um, especially if there are no rashes or other uh, presentation initially of the tick bite. Some of the early signs and symptoms um, can present as uh, flu-like illnesses or presentation of mono in many patients. Um, the, the more common bullseye rash, erythema arith migrans, or many patients can even be asymptomatic. So the most common symptoms are usually fevers, chills, malaise, fatigue, um, just general brain fog, numbness, and tingling. And signs uh, usually can present as a bullseye rash or just swollen glands, uh, red-colored throat. And initially, the treatments are thought to be as antibiotics. The more common signs and symptoms are often fatigue and pain in many patients, but also can mimic any other symptomatic conditions, uh, systemic conditions as well. Often we should consider Lyme in our patients depending on the patient demographic, um, location, or just uh, potential exposure, um, as in if a patient is outdoors often or is around animals, um, they, they're on a higher uh, chances of getting tick-borne disease. They can present with multi-systemic uh, complaints such as uh, pain, fatigue, um, often the diagnosis list considers uh, many syndromes. Um, if our patients are presenting with facial nerve palsies, meningitis, blurred vision, double vision, um, light sensitivity, those are also common initial symptoms. According to the CDC, the initial testing is done with ELISA testing, and if ELISA testing comes out positive, that's when they go over to the Western blot. But often, um, Tick-borne diseases have a tendency of uh, being insensitive in, in the more common testing, and most patients come out negative. The more reliable forms of testing are a combination of PCR, Western blot, IgM, IgG. In the U.S., we have access to some of the specialty labs, uh, like Igenix or Galaxy, which are more thorough forms of testing for Lyme. Uh, general treatment, initially, um, the earlier the patient is treated, uh, the better the results can be, um, and patients most often start by antibiotic treatments, um, but 
often um, they're going to need multiple combination of uh, different treatment possibilities. Uh, there's a lot of controversy regarding uh, treatment protocols and how, how long the duration of the treatment should be. For chronic cases, uh, it should be a combination of antibiotics along with natural su supplements. So just to summarize everything, Lyme disease overall is a pretty complex uh, condition. It can often presents with, present with a spectrum of signs and symptoms. Testing can be unreliable, so we need to be looking at a patient as a whole and just uh, try to troubleshoot what's causing the signs and symptoms and look at a person as a whole. Um, treatment, uh, treatment can fail at times and needs to be re-evaluated multiple times with treatment and testing multiple times. And often, um, layered prevention is the best uh, technique to treat a patient with Lyme. I'm going to introduce a video by Marisol Thomas, who is a celebrity. Uh, Marisol has chronic Lyme disease. She's going to discuss with you her symptoms in the case of misdiagnosis. She and her husband, Rob Thomas, who's a well-known singer-songwriter, are advocates in the Lyme community. Hi, my name is Marisol Thomas. As someone dealing with autoimmune disease, as well as Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, and a host of other co-infections, my journey has been a long and brutal one. It took many years to be properly diagnosed as I continued to worsen. I had a few years of nonstop treatments and protocols which helped get some of my many conditions under control in varying degrees, yet some of my most debilitating symptoms were still present and nothing was helping. The symptoms were so bad I could barely function some days or even leave my home. I've continued to suffer from electrocuting pain that goes from my temples into my eyes that sometimes is so violent it's caused me to go into seizure type episodes. I have severe vice-like head pain and pressure, intermittent TMJ disorder. I developed an advanced, incredibly painful condition called adhesive capsulitis, also known as a frozen shoulder. I have ear and pain pressure that's so bad, it feels like I'll go mad and forces me to wear earplugs almost 24 seven. Loud sounds cause them to pop and creates a horrible crackling sound as if an old transistor radio is being tuned this causes indescribable pain and panic. I have light sensitivity where I can't tolerate bright lights, even on a cloudy day or in the house. Blurry vision where I can't see from far or from near, and my vision seems to continually change, sometimes even daily. I have height and depth instability. Objects appear to move even when they're stationary. One of my favorite ways to relax and escape has always been reading, and that has not only become impossible, but has also become a great source of anxiety. I have such textual bombardment that just reading a paragraph is incredibly difficult. All the words jumble together as if they're all trying to come into focus all at once, causing me to be unable to see anything at all and become panicky. This also happens if I just want to sit outside in my yard with my dogs, which is another thing that has always brought me great happiness and a feeling of safety and security. Instead, it now feels as if the trees and the air itself is attacking, once again, sending me into a panic attack. All these unexplained, uncontrolled symptoms, unsurprisingly, have also caused me to develop a severe panic disorder. I truly started to think I was finally going crazy after all these years. Luckily, I have the support of an amazing family and support system that although have no idea what I was explaining to them, knew that this was very real and not just something in my head. I was really fortunate to be introduced to Dr. William Padula. Meeting him was so important on so many levels. First, he assured me that what was happening to me was, in fact, very real. He also helped me understand that eye doctors couldn't find anything wrong because this is actually a neurological condition that they were missing. With his help, I was also able to see that so many of these unrelated symptoms are actually very connected. My spatial visual process has been compromised by the tick-borne disease. About 70% of all sensory nerves in the body comes from the two eyes. So it turns out that all my visual issues, plus many of these other symptoms that remained after so many medical treatments, 
are not only related, but are due to my compromised spatial visual process that is causing an abnormal postural tone, which is then causing accommodative spasms in my eyes. It's these spasms that can cause many of the symptoms I experience. The electrocuting pain, the head pressure, the dizziness, the ear issues, the severe visual issues, and the panic attacks. It also seems that the adhesive capsulitis came from the increased abnormal postural tone that affects everything from the neck down to the shoulders. It's even affected how I walk and how I stand. I realize everyone's prognosis is different, including how well they'll respond to rehabilitation, which for me consists of physical therapy to help with my posture and balance issues that have occurred due to my visual dysfunction, as well as the use of special glasses with special yoked prisms. My long scary journey is far from over and it's still very unsure, but I wanted to send out this message to all of you attending this Lyme disease vision symposium, because aside from trying to find a course for my own healing, I want to somehow be able to help the many people who continue to suffer without diagnosis. All of you listening to my story right now can help make that happen. Many people with tick-borne disease develop visual symptoms in the early stages of infection. And for some, it clears up as the Lyme and co-infections are treated. But for many like me, with lack of proper diagnosis and treatment, this leads to lifelong, severely debilitating neurological issues that affect your whole body. That is something that not many Lyme literate doctors even understand. This is not just a visual condition. This is a neurological condition that affects so much more than just your vision. It can affect your entire body and it can literally steal your life. Because this is something that has had such an impact on my life, I hope to spread more awareness of this terrible condition brought on by neurological Lyme. I'm hopeful that everyone at this symposium will do what they can to help increase awareness about the need for early diagnosis and hopefully to continue to develop treatment for those of us that were just not so lucky so that maybe we can get back the lives we lost. Thank you so much for your time and commitment to this terrible and misunderstood condition. The problem is that there are visual symptoms and these are often experienced by individuals early on with tick-borne disease. When they go to optometrists and ophthalmologists, they present the symptoms and often show binocular dysfunction. But the binocular dysfunction is often misunderstood because there's a lack of understanding that there's an organic neurological condition causing it. Many of the doctors of patients that I've seen have actually prescribed vision therapy to treat convergence insufficiency and accommodative insufficiency, only to go on for weeks and months without having the condition resolve. So the early diagnosis is missed, and it, this enables an acute phase of Lyme or tick-borne disease to become chronic or neurological. Frequent symptoms and characteristics are that the patients will have blurred vision, and this can uh, affect visual acuity, it affects central vision, and also can affect color vision. Commonly, they have photophobia, diplopia, pain about the eye or adnexa, increased uh, swelling of the eyelids and conjunctival irritation. The characteristics particularly are conjunctivitis, uveitis, choroiditis, depressed corneal reflexes, neuroretinitis, vasculitis, papilledema, in addition to having convergence insufficiency, accommodative insufficiency, and oculomotor dysfunction. Behind this is the fact that Lyme disease affects the brain, and visual processing is in the brain, so we're going to discuss the bimodal visual process and try to understand this relationship. Research by Trevarathan uh, in the 20th century um, and other famous uh, visual scientists have identified that there are actually two visual processing systems. The focal process is what we use in a conscious sense for detailed discrimination, attention, identification, concentration. It's very much oriented to time present. It's conscious. It's in this moment. It has no relationship to gravity. It's related to higher attention and cognitive processing. Uh, 
However, the first visual process that we are all born with is not the focal process. It's a spatial visual process known as the ambient process, and it relates to information coming up from muscles and joints, the proprioceptive system, related to posture, balance, and movement. It's not conscious, it's preconscious. It's proactive. It anticipates change. This system early in childhood...